Welcome to the B Gala Bi, Gay, and Lesbian Alumni of MIT's keynote Sunday brunch. My name is Jeff Weekly. I'm a member of the GLAF board, and I would like to welcome you to Sunday, our third day here at the conference, if you've attended the Sports Leadership Congress. We've got a lot of fantastic content today as well happening all over. This morning, to start things off, after the excellent breakfast, um, I'm going to uh, be introducing Jeff Shang. And Jeff uh, is the artist who is presenting uh, the photographs upstairs, those beautiful photographs. Uh, and Jeff will be then introducing our keynotes, Jordan and Ryan. Uh, I'm not going to linger very long. I just wanted to say thank you for coming this morning. Thank you for spending uh, the weekend with us. Uh, and with that, um, I'll introduce Jeff. So in a few moments, um, I'm going to wind up introducing um, Jordan Goldwarg and Ryan Quinn, two people I've gotten to know over this project who are incredibly powerful people and have become quite dear to me and quite good friends to me. And I can honestly say that their two photo shoots have been two of the most fun I've ever had doing photography in general. Jordan's shoot was first. It was in Vermont a few weeks ago. And um, the snow was melting quite quickly because spring was approaching. And I remember the day it was sleeting. It was not rain nor snow. It was this horrid mixture of just bad weather. And I made Jordan ski for about an hour or two. And then it's raining, and my equipment, I, I was terrified of being electrocuted. And I was walking in knee-deep water, ice water. And at one moment, I said, so at what point do you get frostbite? And he said, when you can't feel your toes. It took me a while to make sure I didn't have frostbite. And um, I wasn't sure what would come out. And the picture upstairs is just quite spectacular for me, because it's this moment that I just think you can see so well into Jordan. Ryan's shoot, which was a week later in Seattle, was incredibly, incredibly fun for a different reason. Um, I think I wanted, I wanted a mountain, and I wanted sky, and I wanted beautiful weather. And it was the one day in Seattle that was sunny. Um, and I mysteriously wound up in Seattle on that day. And it involved me having to borrow a pair of skis and boots and learn how to cross-country ski in one hour while also wearing a 50-pound backpack with all my equipment and going a mile and a half up this mountain somewhere, doing the shoot, and then on the way down from this mountain while I was on these skis, hoping I wouldn't fall on all my equipment, um, I said to myself, this is the most fun I've ever had in photography. And I'm also, um, the little book I have upstairs shows this sort of process, that I'm not just coming in an hour. I'm not, you know, many of these people are my age. And I know them. Um, all over the ring. But it's a process of getting to know these people. It's a project, obviously. it's done, which will hopefully be two years. So I wanted to talk a little about the work and what I do. And um, right now, I'd like to introduce the um, two famous skiers upstairs, are right here, but their pictures are upstairs. So Ryan was born, and he was raised in Alaska, and uh, lived there until he graduated from high school and moved to Salt Lake City to ski for Utah and skied on the Nordic ski team for four years and graduated in May of 2003 with a BA in business administration. He was the two-time NCAA All-American in 2002 and 2003, the NCAA National Championship team in 2003, and the Junior National Champion in 2000. He is now temporarily living in Seattle and writing, and his interests include reading, traveling, and playing the guitar. I have a very good picture of him playing the guitar, by the way. And he is now training for um, a mountain marathon race and a mountain race on the 4th of July in Seward, Alaska. Jordan Goldwag was born and raised in Montreal, where he was a member of the high school soccer, rugby, and cross-country ski teams. He attended Williams College in Western Massachusetts, and he graduated in 2003 with a BA in History and Environmental Studies. At Williams, he was a four-year member of the ski team, which became a defining element of his college experience. And after accepting that he was gay, he soon realized that he did not have to hide his sexual orientation from his teammates, who also were some of his closest friends. Despite the fears that the athletic world would be hostile towards a gay athlete, he came out to his team during his senior year, and he re received tremendous support from his teammates and coaches. 
since graduating, he's at Dartmouth right now coaching the ski team there and also a coach for the New England Junior National Ski Team, which won his first, its first national championship in eight years, thanks to him, I guess. Um, besides staying involved with athletics, he plans to pursue a career in environmental work. And also recently, him and Ryan, who are the cutest couple, I think, on, on, in the country right now, um, have discovered a new way to sort of support the gay athletics college community. And they've been actually um, working on developing a new website for as a sort of a support forum for openly gay high school and collegiate athletes and coaches as well and trainers and all those involved in that area. It's a way to sort of not just have a venue for coming out stories necessarily, but it's a place to sort of further the idea of what happens after you come out. What are the real issues besides just coming out that are involved with high school coaches and high school teams and college teams and athletics? And um, so they're going to come up here, and um, thank you very much. So I'd like to introduce Ryan Quinn, Joel Goldblatt. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Um, I think everybody really appreciates and admires the work that you've done, and uh, it's very, very impressive quality of work, and I think it's going to do a lot to help further the visibility of gay athletes and reach a whole new level of people because it does have that visual aspect to it. Um, first of all, I just want to thank Mac and everybody else who's helped to bring this conference together. I think, uh, you know, for the second year to do this, uh, again, it's been incredibly successful. And even though uh, the turnout this year wasn't quite as strong as it was last year, I really feel that a lot of people got a lot of very useful information and a lot of useful dialogue out of this, out of this weekend. Uh, and I want to thank everybody, all of you, for coming out and making it a success because something like this is really only as successful as its participants. You guys are the ones that bring the ideas. You guys are the ones that bring the energy. And in order for this to continue to be successful, we need people to keep staying involved and to keep thinking about this, these things. Uh, and so I really hope that, you know, this is only the second year that we've done this, and I really hope that everybody will continue supporting this in the years ahead and uh, keep coming out and uh, being a part of it. Gay athletes and, in fact, all people are constantly being influenced by a combination of external and internal factors. And what I mean by this, external factors are things like your family and friends, the media, teammates, and society at large, and its manifestations, however we choose to define it. Internal factors are things like your core beliefs. These are the things that you just inherently feel in your heart that you know are right, that you know are true. A problem, though, is that these external factors can often dominate the internal factors because we live in a society where it's just very easy to be influenced by the things that we see going on around us and be affected by them. When the external factors are negative, which is often the case when you're a struggling gay athlete trying to form your identity and trying to come out, this can cause major problems. And this is when you get start to question your identity and it can become really hard to accept who you are. For gay athletes, because there's such a lack of role models, and this is definitely changing now, but for a lot of young gay athletes, it still is a problem. And because we really are a minority within a minority, the external factors that we see are often very negative and very detrimental to our ability to accept ourselves and come out. The solution, though, is to try to think a little bit more critically about the interaction of these external and internal factors and to seek out positive external factors that can reinforce your own identity and your own sense of self and thus enable you to come out and be successful. In this way, we can develop strong, positive identities as gay athletes, and in the process, we begin to change all those negative external factors and become visible role models for others, thus bringing that energy back to other people and sort of creating a chain whereby we all help each other. So one of the first areas where we see this intersection and this interaction between internal and external factors is in the self-acceptance process of realizing that you're gay. In this stage, the external factors tend to dominate the internal. I was incredibly, incredibly reluctant 
to admit that I was gay in, well into my time in college. I had serious problems with looking at mainstream gay culture and sort of the mainstream gay identity that was presented in the media and identifying that, identifying with that in any way whatsoever. I just would look at media images. I would look at other out athletes. You know, I went to a very small college, um, and there were not a huge number of out athletes there. And so everything that I saw that said gay did not remind me of myself at all. All the external factors, all these things that I saw, said that I could not be both gay and an athlete. And since I clearly knew that I was an athlete, I was on a team, I was playing sports, I was spending a lot of time engaged in physical activity, since I knew I was an athlete, then logically that just meant that I could not possibly be gay. Those two things could not coexist. In high school, I really had no clue what was going on. I recognized from a very early age that I was attracted to other men, but I refused to label it. I refused to say the words, I'm gay. I refused to even think about the fact that I could be gay. I thought that it was just a phase that I was going through. I thought that I just hadn't met the right girl. Things, the same kind of bullshit and lies that I'm sure many of us have told ourselves for a long time. By the time I got to college, I started to have a slightly more realistic view of things, and I could say to myself at least that I'm gay, even if I couldn't admit it to anybody else. But even then, I really couldn't have any kind of long-term self-acceptance. I would sort of say to myself, okay, I'm gay, it's not the end of the world, it's all right. But then I'd think that way for you know a couple of weeks, and then something would happen, and all of a sudden it seemed like the scariest thing in the world again and I would backtrack and think, no, really, I'm not gay. This is just a phase of some kind. It was so bad that even when I started to admit to myself that I was gay, I still thought that I would rather stay single my whole life than admit that I'm gay and live as an openly gay man. I thought that it would be impossible for me to have a meaningful relationship with another man simply because I did not see any other men who were gay who I could identify with, and who I could imagine being with. Eventually, though, I started to look for more positive external factors. The Internet was and continues to be an incredible resource for young gay athletes because it provides a relatively anonymous, safe uh, outlet to find information and to create networks. Positive external factors, I was finally able to overcome my fears and more quickly, a seemingly impossible coexistence. I finally began to realize by seeing other people who had already taken the step and who had already come out and been successful with it and received lots of support that it is possible, after all, to be both gay and an athlete. And now, all of us, by being visible and active, we can begin to change the external factors and make these positive external factors predominate so that the phase of self-acceptance is just that much easier and that much shorter and comes with that much younger in age for other struggling gay athletes. So by sort of examining the factors those and becoming a stronger person and forging our own identity and then going back and changing those external factors so that more positive ones predominate we begin to actually see meaningful change in society. Our culture says something interesting about gay people in sports. It's inherently incompatible. This, and I don't need to remind anyone in this room, is false. But false or not, it is a belief held by most people. Alienation of people, that the alienation of people who are both gay and who love sport is one of the defining characteristics of our identity. I'll start with a quote by Nathaniel Brandon, who wrote in an essay called Alienation, the problem of alienation and the problem of personal identity are inseparable. The man, who lock, the man who lacks a firm sense of personal identity feels alienated. The man who feels alienated lacks a firm sense of personal identity. 
before I jump into how this connection between alienation and personal identity is so important, back my experience. I came out four years ago, and after telling a few safe friends, I decided to come out to my parents. In fact, my parents were the third people that I came out to, and by far the hardest. When I think back to the week when I knew I was going to tell them, I still feel uncomfortable. It was horrible. I had spent a nervous month building up the courage and a miserable week wondering if I had it, and knowing that I never too involved. Even though I'm not a parent, I had and I still have a sense that this must not be an easy balance for a parent to maintain. Although two friends knew I was gay, I had not been able to actually say I'm gay. With them, I had had to angle the conversation until it was really obvious and they just had to ask. My parents were the first persons I actually said the words, I'm gay. When I spoke them, they seemed so but after the months and weeks of personal hell that had led to those words finally coming out, it suddenly seemed that a relief it suddenly seemed a relief that they were so irrevocable. There was something comforting about the idea that there was no turning back. My first away from home. But I did see some deep shock and confusion in those first few weeks. and asking of strange questions, at least questions strange. For example, did you meet anyone who convinced you you were gay? How do you know you're gay? Are you attracted to younger boys? Now keep in mind, they're asking these questions with genuine seriousness and sympathy. And then came the strangest question of all the one that made me realize that there existed a great misunderstanding and a lack of awareness about what it means to be gay. My parents asked, does this affect your interest in skiing? I had been so caught up in thinking about me and the very one-sided and very distorted view about my sexual orientation that I hadn't thought about how other people who actually knew and loved me would react. I hadn't expected anything, but I was definitely bracing for the worst. My first instinct, was to answer this question with a little sarcastic frustration. Yes, mom and dad, I'm, s not, I'm not just gay, but I'm so gay that I'm not interested in skiing anymore. But I suddenly realized that my parents were, not, were concerned, not about skiing, but about me changing, about me not being myself. They knew that I loved to ski and loved to compete, and I imagine it scared them incredibly to think that that was changing, or that anything about me was changing. In the weeks that followed, they learned a lot, and very quickly they had regained a sense of comfort towards this part of me that was new to them. And after a while, it started to make sense. What they had previously known about homosexuality or gay people, or what they thought they knew, was largely wrong. I was showing them that I had not changed. It was their ideas about gay people that would have to change. I didn't know it then, but this pattern of how people re reacted to me coming out to them would be a very common reoccurrence. I didn't decide to come out to my ski team until the end of my sophomore year. I was not encouraged to come out by anyone, and I had no reason to suspect, I had no reason to think that my teammates suspected I was gay. I decided to come out to them because I was becoming better and better friends with these people, and I was still hiding from them. Often I would make up lame excuses for why I couldn't go out to dinner or to a party with my teammates. Most didn't know I was gay, but they must have sensed that something was wrong. College athletes don't have a lot of spare time, and when they do, they spend it with friends who are their teammates. It must have been strange that I had a separate group of friends that I also hung out with. These friends were my gay friends, some of them whom I dated, but mostly they were just friends. They filled out the social needs that I thought couldn't be fulfilled by my teammates. They were gay, and so I had that in common with them. But this split grew old. I became sick of having two sets of friends who I, thought I, who I thought would never overlap and who I had to keep separate. So part of the reason I came out was simply because I no longer wanted to deal with the separation. 
I was ready to deal with harassment, if that's what it came to, but no more secrets. The other part was that I felt that some of my ski friends were so close to me that it would be almost offensive not to tell them. So I made the decision to come out to my team, and I decided who I would tell first. In skiing, men's and women's teams compete separately, but in training and travel traveling, they're treated as one big team, and thus I had equally close friends on both the men's and women's side. It happened that I made up my mind to start coming out to teammates in February, and soon I was presented with what seemed like a perfect opportunity. Gretchen was a friend on the team who I'd become very close to through months of talks with her about her mother's recent losing battle with cancer. Gretchen had been complaining to me for two weeks now that she did not have a date for Valentine's Day, and she seemed mortified at the prospect of spending the evening home alone. So a few days before the dreaded day, I told her that since neither of us had any plans, why don't she just come over and I'll make dinner and we can watch a movie or whatever. She accepted. Now, apparently, when you ask a girl over for dinner <laughs> and a movie on Valentine's Day, this sends out some very specific singles, all of which, in my anxiety, I completely ignored. It took all night, a very long night, to overcome this initial misunderstanding and proceed to my original intent. And even then I couldn't just say it. But I did enough hinting and obvious beating around the bush that finally she asked and I could just say yes instead of I'm gay. Again, it was that feeling of finality and crossing the point of no return that I expected to be terrifying, yet once it was passed, it was just a huge relief. Starting the next day, I gradually began telling teammates I wanted to tell them all individually. I was worried that they would be offended if they merely heard about it from others, and I wanted to see that I was willing to face it and talk about it. For whatever reasons, it was easier to tell the girls than the guys. But after I had told a few girls with encouraging results, I had to start telling my guy teammates. The first one I told was my best friend, and for many reasons directly related to me coming out to him, he still is my best friend. This was not as difficult as telling my parents, but certainly it was close. I had been Zach's roommate for a year, we were the same age, we were about the same ability in skiing, and so we pushed each other all summer in training and all winter in competitions. It was the last week of our sophomore season, and we were getting ready to go to a party or something. I forget what we were going to do, but I will never forget the short exchange we had standing in our kitchen. We had some shots poured on the counter, and we had, we raised them to do a little toast for the season and our, our future world dominance in the sport. And he stopped and waited. And I knew I had crossed that line and would have to proceed to tell him. I'm a fag, I said. Without missing a beat, he said, I know. I don't know if he knew that he knew. I don't know if I knew that he knew or had suspected, but that didn't matter. He was a good enough friend that I didn't want to keep it a secret anymore. I told him that I just wanted it to be in the open. He said thanks for telling him that I shouldn't have to keep it a secret. And then he said something that floored me. He said, and you're not a fag. You just happen to like other guys. I bring these examples up, not because the coming out story itself is particularly crucial, but because throughout all of these experiences, I was starting to notice some key cause and effect relationships. And mostly I was seeing by opening up myself to others, I was being challenged to become more aware of myself. If there's one thing that is the basis for acceptance of yourself or from others, it is a continuing expansion of your self-knowledge. People seem to recognize this in others, and they respect it. Sorry, we're not done yet. We took a page from Mark and Holly last year and decided that we'd alternate a bit, so you got to sit through a bit more. Um, returning to the earlier idea of this interaction between things going on inside of you and things that you influenced uh, from on the other side, once you start coming out, I feel that there's a much greater balance reached between these external and internal factors. But here there's still a great fear of
come out because you think that in doing so, things are going to change and you're going to make other people upset. We're still afraid of what other people might think. Often, though, the reality is that people's reactions are not at all what we expect. I've only once been outed accidentally when I didn't intend for somebody to know, and it actually was exactly a year ago, a couple days after last year's conference. At that point, I was out to pretty much everybody that I know, all my friends, all my family, all my teammates. The only people I decided not to tell were my grandparents. And of my three living grandparents, I just decided, and I was very comfortable with the idea that they were just too old, they were too sick, the ones that weren't sick were spending too much energy taking care of the ones who were, and it just wasn't worth it in the long run for me to come out to them. My grandfather, however, in his retirement, decided that it would be a fun thing to do to learn how to use a computer. So he hired a private instructor, took my dad's old laptop, and thought, wow, it would be really great if I can check the weather on the internet and email my kids and my grandkids and my friends. And so after a couple of introductory lessons, just learning how to use the actual computer, he was finally ready to get on the internet. And as a preliminary exercise, the instructor suggested that he type our family name, Goldwarg, into Google and see what comes up. And as far... As far as we know, uh, my extended family, we're the only Goldwargs in the world. It's a unique name. So he types in Goldwarg to Google, hits enter, and the very first hit that comes up is an article that I wrote for Outsports about coming out to the ski team at Williams. <laughs> the instructor tried to convince him that it must be a different Jordan Goldwarg. <laughs> My picture was right at the top of the page. <laughs> My grandfather, to his credit, stayed calm. And after the lesson was over, he drove over to my parents' house. And he told them that he had something that he wanted to talk about. <laughs> told them that he had seen the article and that he was definitely very surprised, but that he was fine with it and that he respected me for it and that I was still the same person I had always been and that he understood. And to his credit, even though we haven't really talked about it very much, we sort of acknowledge it. You know, I, I called him up and said that I heard that he had seen it. Um, to his credit, now, often, if he's reading the newspaper and sees an article related to uh, gay issues, he'll clip it out and send it to my parents. And that really shows me that he's fine with it. So oftentimes, the reactions that we get run completely counter to what our fears are. For coming out to the ski team, though, which happened before this all, I just didn't want them to be uncomfortable. I didn't want to hurt my position on the team. But it got to the point where my skiing friends were really the last of my friends who didn't know that I was gay. I had told a few of my closer friends on the team individually before, uh, you know, early on in the coming out process. But it got to the point where the majority of my teammates still didn't know that I was gay. And these were the people that I spent more time with than anybody else. These were the people who I was training with every day, having dinner with every night, going to races with every weekend. And it really started to eat away at me that these people, who were some of my closest friends, did not know who I really was. So finally, at our annual Christmas training camp, everybody was just sitting around after dinner one night, and uh, I said that I had something that I wanted to talk about. And I just sat there and said, I'm gay. And said a couple more things after that. And then there was just this stunned silence. And, you know, this wasn't the usual after-dinner conversation. So I thought that, that was normal. But afterwards, later on that night, people came out to me individually and said that they really respected my decision and that they admired it and that, their opinions of me had not changed at all. And so that was a huge relief. And that was the start of realizing that really all my fears had been unfounded and that these wonderful people were going to be completely fine with the fact that I'm gay. Coming out, I think, illustrates very clearly how closely intertwined 
these internal factors and external factors that I was talking about are linked. You want to come out for yourself. You want to come out because you feel like it's something internally that you need to do. But if things go badly, you don't have any control over it. It's other people's reactions. It's other people's behavior that can create a negative experience for you. But even the actual coming out is both internal and external. As much as I wanted to come out for myself, I also wanted to come out for my teammates. I felt like they needed to know who I am and that they needed to understand me more fully. The only thing that was scarier than coming out was the thought of graduating without coming out. The message here is that we don't live in a vacuum and we can't help but being affected by these external factors no matter how strong we are. But maybe it's through these interactions and through the way these external and internal factors mix that we grow as people and help to develop both our own identities and the identities of other people. We become ourselves by critically evaluating these interactions to shape our identity without needing to be labeled by others. where we see this interaction between internal and external factors is in figuring out the difference between mere tolerance and total acceptance. I think this is one of the hardest things to deal with and to understand after I came out because it was really hard for me to know if my teammates were merely tolerant of me and just sort of going along with it or if they truly accepted it and were embracing the fact that I'm gay. In this case, what needs to happen after you become comfortable with yourself and form your identity as a gay athlete is internal factors. You need to use your own identity to help shape the world around you. Silence is the biggest problem here. We're so afraid of offending other people. I think American culture is just incredibly polite to a fault sometimes. We're so afraid of offending other people that we just keep quiet and don't say anything. But this makes it really hard to know if we're accepted or not because our teammates are unsure of our comfort level. And to their credit, they don't want to say anything that's going to make us uncomfortable or make them seem insensitive. We don't need to be in people's faces being gay. We don't need to be you know, completely blatant about it more so than a straight person would be about their, sexual, about their sexual orientation. But we should have the same freedom of expression to talk about our boyfriends, to talk about dates, talk about any other problems that we have that our straight teammates do. After a while, when I first, for a while when I first came out, I didn't want to talk about it that much because I, I was uncomfortable and I didn't want them to be uncomfortable, but at the same time, they didn't want to talk about it because they didn't want me to be uncomfortable. So finally, I started just you know, mentioning it in subtle ways and the reaction that I started getting made me that they were okay with it. And once they saw me talking about it, they realized that they could talk about it. I remember one time I was running a little bit late for practice and the rest of the team was already out sitting in the van waiting for me. And boy. And afterwards, some of the girls on the team came up to me and they said, Jordan, I can't believe what Peter said at practice today. I was so hurt. You would have been so angry. I was so offensive. I just can't believe he would say something like that. But when they told me what he had actually said, I was like, no, 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 that's great. That shows me that he actually accepts it. And that is the same thing that he would do to somebody else about some other characteristic that they had. And that means that the fact that he can talk about it means that he's actually comfortable with it. If he was uncomfortable, he wouldn't have said anything. But by being able to do that and just have him realize that this is one aspect of who I am. I mean, he could have said, Jesus Christ, where is that damn Canadian? It would have been exactly the same thing in, in, my, in my view. So this is a subtle but very effective form of activism, I think. And it's just being yourself and letting the one-on-one -on -one interactions speak for themselves. It's so critical and so important that the one-on-one -on -one interactions that we have with our teammates, think about how many people you interact with over the course of a year in your life. And obviously, if it's just somebody who you're casually meeting you know, in a store, you don't have to let them know that you're gay. But the people who you do have sort of ongoing interactions with, 
when you think about how many people there are, and if you let every single one of those people know that you're gay and you show them that this is just one part of who you are and that you're a complete person, that is an incredible number of people that you have an impact on over the course of your life. Just be a positive role model, not for gay athletes, not for all athletes, but for society in general and for all people. Use these interactions to our advantage and use them to help increase our visibility. One of the most touching things that somebody has said to me since I came out happened just this past week. Uh, I had sort of my weekly staff meeting with the two head coaches that I work with at Dartmouth, and we were just going over the season, doing a debrief. And after we had talked about all the skiing aspects and training and how the program had run and how successful we had been over the course of the season, the head coach, the head men's coach, said to me, Jordan, I also just want to thank you for the perspective that you bring to the team. And by being gay, but by going about it in such a way that people really see you just as the good person that you are, you really have had an impact on the behavior of the team this year. I've never seen the men's team have such a high level of respect for each other and for everybody else, not just in the issue of sexual orientation, but about everything. He said that sort of, you know, the locker room talk this year had been at a higher level than he'd ever heard it at, and a lot of just sort of the high school crap that often goes on was gone. And I hadn't thought about that when I was just coaching and, and being myself. I had no idea that I was having any kind of impact on anybody. But obviously other people saw this and rose to the occasion and realized that they too didn't have to sort of sink to a lower level and that they could rise above that. So I think we have the ability to do a tremendous amount of good even when we don't even realize it, simply by being ourselves and being role models. When we do that, we begin to change all these external factors and we make the external factors so much more positive for everybody and people don't need to be scared away by those negative images that they see because it's really the positive images that will begin to dominate. Uh, I had such a supportive team when I was coming out uh, that when I had finally come out to them, it left myself asking what the big deal was. What made it so difficult for me to accept that I was gay and for moving from there towards actually coming out? But more important, where were all the others? I know there are gay, other gay college athletes. They are out there. Some are in this room, but we are only a small fraction of the gay athletes who are competing in schools across the country. This became very troubling to me. I was never discriminated against explicitly. I was never harassed. All the fears I had about how people were going to react pr pr proved to be completely unfounded. So what is perpetuating the silence? Is it really just perceptions and fears? I think that it is. I did some work with the athletic department at the University of Utah to try to raise awareness about gay athletes. The response was almost entirely supportive, but there was a hidden clause tucked in with their support, and it came from a lack of awareness. My team, of course, was the exception because they knew me so well. But the administrators, coaches, and athletes on other teams had an interesting response. Essentially, they told me, I admire you and I respect you for coming out. I think it's great. I have no problem with it. Oh, but there are no gay athletes on my team. For a long time, this bothered me. No other athletes came out while I was at Utah, but I doubt it was because they weren't there. The athletic world is going through psychological growing pains. And while more and more people are willing to admit that gay athletes exist, few are ready to take it personally, to look around them and say, hey, look, one of my teammates is gay. One of my teammates, a guy that I practice and compete with every day, might be gay, and he thinks that he has to hide this from me. Or a gay athlete is thinking, I know I'm gay, and I know that there are other gay athletes that have come out and been accepted, but that was just because they were in swimming or soccer, or because they go to that school or this or that. It seems that there is always some way to pass the buck and get yourself off the hook. This is a flaw that can only disappear if individuals take responsibility. Ultimately, you have to do the work. 
there are not a lot of shortcuts. I've done quite a bit of reading and writing and thinking about this process of coming out and investigating how my identity has developed. And through all of this, I've been trying to discover what is really at the foundation of the problems that are inhibiting gay athletes from facing their identity. We've all seen how the problems manifest themselves. The gay bashing, the homophobic remarks, the perceptions of what it means to be a gay college athlete. These vary widely across the spectrum of different sports. And we at this conference have come here to work out these problems. We recognize the problems in our daily lives and communities, and we believe there is a solution. If there were no problems with gay athletes in sports, we wouldn't be here. We are here because we are reacting to problems that we want to fix. And even on a larger scale beyond this conference, in the context of other gay issues, there's a, still a struggle between the problem and then our reaction, which eventually overcomes it. We are in a battle right now that has many fronts. There are legal battles, battles over gay marriage, battles over partner benefits, or whether certain school groups will be allowed. These battles are easy to become involved in, in some sense, because they are very well defined. For the most part, it's one side against the other, and you simply choose a side. It's the human rights campaign against fundamentalist organizations. It's Democrats versus Republicans, etc. In all of these cases, our goals are defined not by our own identities or by our specific purpose, but by how we are going to prove the other side wrong. Inevitably, this, the issue polarizes and distorts itself. The battlefront I've left out so far in this example is the personal and the social battle which includes the formation and the role of identity. This is separate from the other battles I've mentioned because it is not well-defined and is not always clear when you've secured a victory or are even moving towards one. But this in many ways is the most important because it makes a lasting change in attitudes and beliefs, not just laws and policies. I'm not a psychologist, but for the sake of this discussion, I'll try to expand on what I mean when I say identity and why it is so important. Identity is a combination of conscious and unconscious estimations of ourselves. Although pieces of our identity can be stressed or concealed at any one time, no piece at any time is ever irrelevant to the whole. I did not feel this way while I was still in the closet. Most closeted gay athletes tend to lean more on introspection, thus creating a distorted estimation of how the world perceives them and how their identity develops. The sexual orientation was everything while I was still in the closet. I perceived it as the most important part of my identity, and because I feared the reaction from others, I kept it to myself and thought about it. While this introspection was a good first step, it did definitely distort my estimation of its importance. I felt like the piece of my identity that was gay was taking over all of the others. Now I know that I don't have to be a psychologist to make this next claim. It is impossible physically, psychologically, philosophically, to be anyone other than yourself. It is impossible. But yet we try, and we are encouraged to try. So next time you find yourself trying, or you find yourself in a situation where you feel the pressure to try to be something that you are not and cannot, remind yourself that it is unreasonable. Also keep in mind that there's more important things at stake. You cannot be happy unless you are yourself. Otherwise, whose happiness is it? Before I conclude, I would like to talk about something that plays a big part in the formation of our identity, that is role models. Unfortunately, there is a deficiency of gay athletes in the high school and college level to serve as role models, just as there are not enough role models for them to look up to. But I don't think that our end goals need to be the creation of more role models. They are out there and more will emerge on their own as they have to. It is more important to discuss important to us as individuals. Role models help us conceptualize our world and our place in it. In a way, they are the landmarks of our identities. My role models are not just people They serve as the actual I am aiming for. In other words, I definitely want to be the person who is my role model, but I do set pieces of their experience and make them the targets for my own personal aims. For most process, but I think recognizing it and making it even a little bit more conscious can go a long way in investigating who you are. The function of role models is to balance our internal perceptions with our external surroundings. Most people tend to separate the internal and external as two separate and sometimes even opposing worlds. 
but they're not opposing and they must be brought together and role models help with this. For example, I could not have conceived of and developed my interest in skiing without watching certain race videos of Bjorn ten Olympic gold medals. I had to see him and recognize what he was doing in myself. It takes that combination of introspection and a grasp on external surroundings to properly form our goals and our identity. And when there is a deficiency of role models, as there are in this community, then there is less material to draw from. And perhaps this is one of the reasons athletes are slow to come out. This conference has been a wonderful opportunity to connect with all engaged. But I think the real work, work starts today when we leave because it's the individual actions and the one-on-one -on -one influence that we have that leads to real progress and the most profound change. The world is the sports world, but you don't have to wait for the rest of the world. You don't have to let your purpose be defined by an opposing one. Do work to investigate yourself and find that area where you can start to challenge someone else's views about gay athletes. Everyone here is at a different stage, but each stage is important. If you are in the closet, reach out to another athlete who has successfully come out and see what you can learn. If you are out, you can work to end the silence that continues in our athletic departments. Or if you don't like speaking, you can sit down and write an essay for the journal that Jordan and I are doing. Uh, or connect in other ways over the internet. The bottom line is that we've started talking now we need to keep talking, keep challenging ourselves and challenging each other, and we need to keep it personal. Thanks.